Well, hi, guys. It's great to be with you guys today. And welcome to those that are watching us online. <clears throat> you guys are incredibly quiet. Wait a minute. Give a shout out to the Lord. Go, yay, God. Here we go. Thank you, thank you. That makes me feel better. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, you know, we're glad that you're here today. I love the video, right? Because the video kind of captures what, what took place this year, even though, you know, we live in, in difficult, strange times, right? But I, I love it. I, I love watching it. You know, um, when the Lord spoke to Pastor Andy and I over 30 years ago about starting a church, he gave us a mission. He said, your mission, Sharon and Andy, are to, are to make a church, right, that would be a contemporary extension to, of the good news of Jesus Christ to your community and to help people, ordinary people like me and you, find and fulfill God's extraordinary plans and callings, his purpose for our life. And so we've been at it all these years, and we kind of refined it, and now you hear us talking a lot about the vision part of it. And the vision, right, has four parts to it. We want to help people to know God. And I don't just mean know his name, right? I mean know him personally in his heart, in their hearts. And this past year, we had 524 people tell us that they gave their life to Christ. That's pretty remarkable, guys, right? So that's the first part of our vision. The uh, second part is to help people find freedom, right? To be able to discover that they are children of the God Most High. And we do that through our small groups or our vineyard network here is what we call it. And so we had, even though the pandemic's here and, and all the variant stuff's going on, we still had 67% of the people participating in small groups, right? Which I think is fantastic. And then we just finished celebrating this past weekend our freedom uh, conference. We do this twice a year, right? And they're associated with our classes. And it's fantastic. Now, this year we had over 200 people participating with these things, right? Finding freedom, being able to discover how God has uh, made them and be able to walk in that fully. And so that's exciting. And then, of course, our other two parts of our vision are to um, help people to discover their purpose in life, which is yoked up with our uh, growth track classes we do, right? And so we had in that one, we had 350 people this year go through those classes, right? And then they acclimate onto a team, a dream team, uh, that they are learning to make a difference. Guys, this vision is coming about no matter what the environment is happening, right? And so I'm excited to tell you these things and to share with you. Now, I do have a message that's on my heart today, but before I go into that message to share with you what Jesus has been sharing with me, what I'm going to ask you to do is bow your heads, and I'm going to ask for the Holy Spirit's presence to come even more than it is now, right? That's the third person of the Trinity that lives inside us. I'm going to just ask him to come and help us to be attentive. So bow your heads with me. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are in this place right now. And I ask, God, that you would awaken our hearts, Lord God, and our minds. Yes, Father, that you would temper our, our wills, Lord, that we might stay focused on what it is that you have to say to us, Lord. You see, Father, I'm very aware I can say a thousand words, but one touch from you, it changes everything. And so I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come. You've brought each person here God says he knows the hairs on your head. He is acquainted with you. And whether you're watching online or you're in the audience, God has brought you here. He has a message for you today. Be expecting how he's going to come and speak with you. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, guys, I do want to talk to you about something that's on my heart today. And uh, we are going to talk about leaving a legacy today. Okay, that's what's been on my heart. You know, this past fall, I'm a baseball fan. This past fall, you know, we had the World Series, and I was thrilled to pieces that Atlantic Braves took it, right? Um, I love they beat the, you know, the Houston Astros. So I was like ecstatic. I was traveling at the time. Every time I went to an airport, I went to a different hotel. I'm like, where's it at? Where's it at? You know, so I could watch, and I really enjoyed it. But you know, as much as I enjoyed it, what I really enjoyed and what touched my heart was when they did an ode or they did a, um, a, a nod, right, uh, to this guy that I happen to like a lot. Um, and I thought, it, you know, they brought his family up. He passed away this year. It's Hank Aaron, right? And uh, they, they brought his family up, and they uh, talked about his legacy and things like that. 
If you don't know, he holds the world, he holds the, uh, the record for the, the most home run hits, right? He took it from Babe Ruth way back when, and he held on to it for 33 years until Barry Bond took it from him, and here he is right here, right? Now, what I love about this is that this guy is not only was he uh, outstanding in his sport, right? But when you follow his life, he left a legacy, a huge legacy, an impact, right? He, he made a difference in the time and the culture by the way he lived and the justice he brought in uh, to, to his baseball career. And so he ended up finishing up with Atlantic Brace, and that's why they, they, uh, they, they did that little memorial for him and, and talked about him. But, I mean, you could read everywhere. There was a buzz in the air that was going on. Even, even Jimmy Carter, one of our presidents, the 39th president, he even wrote in there how he was his hero, and I go, he's mine too, right, and stuff. And so what we see here is somebody who left a legacy, right? Left a legacy that impacted not just the athletic uh, people, in, in, you know, that, that do athletics, but it also impacted young people's lives and people of diversity, right? And so what we see here is a rich, a rich legacy. And so I got to wondering, I wonder how we can do that. I wonder how we can live our lives to leave a legacy that outlasts us, that when we're gone, our legacy stays and remains, right, and blesses people and shows them the way to walk and the place to go to. And so I want to talk to you about that today. And here's my scripture that I want to base on, right? It says, uh, good will come to him who is generous and leads, lends freely, who conducts his affairs with justice. And that's what you've seen in Hank Aaron uh, surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered. That's your legacy forever. And so these are talking about values that we lay down in our lives, values that we choose to do, right? And so I want to I share with you today some of these values that I think if we looked at our life and we, and we said, how are we doing in these, that they could just revolutionize us and help us to set in that trajectory where we can leave a life of legacy behind, one that outlasts our own lives, right? And so I want to show you that today. So here you go. Leaving a life of legacy. First thing it's to do, it's going to take faith, right? It's going to take faith. And if you're a Bible reader, the minute I put that up, you probably thought about a Hebrews 11, 1. It says, faith is the reality of what we hope for, the proof of what we do not see, right? And so we know that. But I want to tell you that faith is more than just belief. Faith, what it does is it stretches you to see something that doesn't exist. It makes you want to dream, right? And the Bible says it's the substance. We don't see it. It's not here yet. But, but you know what? We can uh, command and, and work with the Holy Spirit to help us to see what's not there yet. You see, when you partner up with the Holy Spirit, it leads you in that direction, right? So we want to make sure that we can see it. That's where faith anchors itself. And what we can see, right? So here you go. Then your family, my friends. You know, I don't just see Hampton Roads as it is. I see it different. I see it as, not as it currently is, but as I would think the Lord would want it. And so I see that true with our nation and our, and our world. I see something different that God wants to do here. And so I have hopes and I have dreams and I have aspirations. And those are all anchored in my faith of what I don't yet see, but what God is going to do. Now, I wanted to bring you something from my heart that shows you how I interact with this scripture. It's very much from my heart. So and, and if I cry or I get nervous, it's because I'm exposing my inner self to you, okay? So just give me a little grace with that one. You know, I went to a conference with some pastors, and one of the pastors stood up and was talking about how we could improve our prayer life and, and, you know, really get tangible within our petitions and stuff. And so they encouraged us to write, to start to journal about uh, writing about what I see in the church. What is it that I feel like God is birthing in us, right? So I have a list. I've taken it from my journal and I printed it out. I'm going to read it to you guys, okay? This is my prayers. This is my heart for each and every one of you in our church. It says this, oh, Lord, I see a church where the members, where the members see an, that it's an honor 
and a responsibility to create an inviting culture where everyone feels welcomed and feels like they're coming home. I see a church that never gives up searching for the lost because God never gave up on them. I see a church whose ministry and partnership goes towards the poor and the disadvantaged in our community and in the world. I see a church full of Green Beret people who are willing to deal with their yesterday so they don't get in, the, in, 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 the, uh, they don't get in their way for the present or for the future that they can fully become children of the God Most High and find freedom. I see a church where the people understand their shape, their God-given shape. Not only do they understand it, they begin to sharpen it so that they can serve other people. I see a church that is so life-giving that the building cannot contain their enthusiasm and it spills over into the culture. I see a church where people find have found a real relationship with God, not just religion, where they, where they see themselves as living for God, and it's an honor and it's a privilege. I see a church where people are, where people are continuing to take their next steps and moving forward. I see a church that is committed to the servicing those in Hampton Roads, those that would never come and walk through the doors of a church and we go to them instead and we show them the love of Christ so that their hearts might be opened. I see a church that is full of compassion and love and draws people from different cultures that might be lost or hopeless. And they draw them into a relationship where they can find hope. And they can find answers and encouragement. I see a church that is committed to raising up the next generation of leaders and the next generation I see them raising up so that they would take this world for Christ and they do it unapologetically and they take their place. And I see a church where the people are so kingdom-minded that their whole lifestyle is oriented around that until they see revival and God breaking in. I see a church that realizes none of this could happen without the commitment to prayer and to fasting and to partnering up with the Holy Spirit. And so they are mindful and enthusiastic about developing those things within themselves and gaining a lifestyle. I see a church where people are generous, beyond generous. They give of their resources, their time, and their lives. And I see a church where Jesus Christ is famous, and to him be the glory. This is what I see. This is my prayer. This is my anchor of my faith. And I share this with you guys to show you my faith is not that it's not just a belief. I see this. And to this end, I work. And when I look at you, I see these things already being fulfilled. And I love you. I love you dearly. And I see we still have a long way to go, but we're there. We are committing these things. Matter of fact, I want you to know that what I see in Hampton Roads, what I see in our church is that God is building a house for himself and he's building it not with brick and mortar, but with hearts and minds of people, of you guys. A place where he can come and he can dwell, as the scripture tells us here. In uh, Ephesians 2, 20, 22, it says, he's using, all, all, he's using us all, irrespective of how we got here, in what he is building. He uses the apostles and the prophets for the foundation. That's laying down who we are, right? But watch this now. This is important for you to get. Now he's using you. You put your name in there. Now he's using Sharon. Now he's using Debbie. Now he's using you. You put your name in there, right? He's fitting you. To, and here you go, brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all parts together. We're all united in Christ. Here you go. Here is the seeing I'm talking about. We see it. We see it. We see it. We see it. And because we see it, we can have faith. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. <laughs> I love this. I love this. Give me an amen. amen. Amen, right? Amen, because that's what I see God doing here. 
And so this, this leaving a legacy, we must be about the Father's work, right? And he says, you must have faith and you must be able to see it. And then he gives us another value that we have to get if we're going to leave a legacy. And that is it takes sacrifice. It takes sacrifice, right? You know, to achieve anything great, we have to lay down something. We have to lay down our own personal comforts. We have to lay down our own self-focus, which we are all prone to do that, right? We have to lay it down. And, and so this church cannot just exist for you guys and, and for us and our own needs. It must exist for those people that aren't here yet. And we keep that in our mind and we sacrifice to that end. You see, I believe that God knows our heart. I believe he knows our heart and he wants us to do the intentional lean, right? To lean into sacrifice. And you know what that's going to take from us? It's going to take a choice. We're going to have to choose to do this, right? It's not something that comes naturally. We have to choose it. Now, I know some of you are going like, why would I choose to do that? Why do I choose to build something when people aren't even here and I don't even know them? Because that's what Jesus did for you. Jesus did that for you, right? He put you first. I mean, isn't it true that we were lost, right? And we were in sin and he came and he found us? Yes, he did. He, he sacrificed his self so that you might be connected to the Father. He went to the cross for you. He gave the ultimate sacrifice, his own life, for you. You matter to him. Matter of fact, I know there are people in this audience and that are watching online and I'm talking about Jesus like he's my best friend. And that's because he is. But that's the relationship he wants with you. He wants that intimacy and that closeness. And if you feel far from God today at the end of my time talking, I'm going to give you an opportunity, an opportunity to pray with me and to come home to Christ because that's what he brought you here to hear. He wants to breathe hope into you again where you feel hopeless. He wants to give you hope. He wants to give you a home and a place. See, he's seen the world and how it's ravished you, and he's calling you home. And I'm going to give you that opportunity. And those of us, <laughs> those of us who were blind, we now see. We were lost. I was so lost. And Father found me. And for that, I am eternally grateful. I am so grateful. That's why I put people in front of myself. That's why I build a church for people I don't even know yet. Because I have such gratitude. You see, those of us who have been forgiven much, we love much. And so people, this is what God is asking us. He's saying, if you want a life of legacy, you must choose sacrificially to give up yourself, to put yourself last, put others first, right? It's a whole different mindset that we need to get involved with. Matter of fact, there's a scripture here in verse Peter that says, you also, like living stones, there's that stone again, right? So he's talking to us, the church. He says, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. So how does one become holy in a priesthood, representing Jesus Christ? By doing this. Offering special sacrifices, right? Spiritual sacrifices. By our sacrificial living is how we become priests of God. Do you see that? Uh, and these are acceptable to God through his son, Jesus Christ. And so we need to do that. If we want a legacy, we want something to go way beyond us, then we need to know that we are called to live sacrificially. You know, there's a colloquialism that we have here in America. If somebody does something that's really nice or extraordinary, you watch it on TV or whatever, they say, oh, we was being a good Samaritan. We even have a law that says the Samaritan law, right? But did you know that that is all part of scripture, that there's a story that Jesus tells about the Good Samaritan, right? And it's in Luke, it's in Luke 10, right? He talks about it and it goes like this. There's a man who left uh, Jerusalem and he's going down to Jericho, right? And on his journey there, some robbers rob him, but they don't just rob him and steal everything. They beat him up like he's half dead and they leave him naked, right? And he's on the side of the road. And then the Bible says, the Bible says, sarcastically well luckily a priest came right and he says it sarcastically because the priest looks at the hurting man and he angles away from the hurt and goes around and then the bible tells us a second 
priest or second Levite is a religious person, comes by. He sees the man also, and he angles away from him. And then it talks about a third man coming, and this man is Samarian, right? Now, here's the interesting thing you need to know. The Samaritan, they hated the Jews. There was like a culture war going on, right? Huge. If anybody had any reason to hate, it was these two, right? And yet it says when the Samaritan looked at the man, he had pity and he had compassion in his heart, and he stopped. He went over to him. He went running into the hurt, right? And it was there that he bent down and he he bandaged up his wounds and he put him on his own donkey and he took him to the inn and he tried to take care of him for a day or so. And then he told the innkeeper, you know, he needs to recover. If there's anything that's spent on, on, on for him, I will take care of it personally when I return, right? And so he took personal responsibility for this man. His culture says we shouldn't have cared, right? His culture said he should have said, you know, all these mean things, and he didn't. His compassion, he ran into it. What I want you to see here is we remember the Samaritan because he chose to sacrifice his agenda. He chose to stop. He chose to run into the pain that he was looking at, right? And because of that, we remember him. It's 2,000 years later. He's part of our colloquialisms now. We remember the Good Samaritan. If we want a life that outlasts us, that has a legacy attached with it, then we need to understand it causes us to have to choose to sacrifice what we have, right? We need to choose to do that. Here you go. Here's another value I think that that really can uh, make a difference when we're leaving a legacy. It's this one. It takes generosity. It takes generosity, big-heartedness, right? We're going to have to be big-hearted with our resources and who we are, right, to advance the causes of Christ in, in our, our community. So we need to be generous. But really in this, we are also looking at it doesn't just take being generous. We give it. We actually take that step, right? We need to be willing to to be generous with people in order to leave a legacy behind. Now, I don't have to tell you people here at Vineyard about generosity because you guys are very generous. You are so generous. I am so proud to be a partner with you guys, to be part of this, right? You are some of the most generous people I know. You know, we're getting ready to do something with our building, and I was down at the city working with some folks, and and one of the guys there, he looked at my application, and he saw on there, you know, that we were, we were talking about uh, Vineyard Church. And he goes, I know this church. <laughs> you know, I go, you do? How do you know it? Right? I didn't know if he'd say come by or something. He goes, oh, I heard about all the people you fed during the pandemic. <laughs> I was so proud. So proud. Right? And then when I was in Arizona at a conference, uh, you know, this, this fall, right, I was there as, as uh, thousands of people, and I heard through the grapevine that there was a national, uh, a Mexican nationalist that was looking for me, right? And she was uh, looking for me. So finally, we meet up, we start to talk, and she goes, oh, I just wanted to tell you thank you. You don't understand your, your participation with us has changed my life, right? Has just rewritten my whole life story. And now, Not only me, but also my community in which I work. And you guys have made such a difference. And I wanted to tell you that. And I wanted to to thank you. I felt so honored. I felt so honored. And it's not me. It's you. It's you. I just got to hear the words, but it's you. You see, every time that you give, every time that you've gone to the Mexico mission, you have changed the fate of thousands of lives and you don't even realize it but you have because you're generous and you give and your heart is big and it makes a difference reminds me of what it says in the scripture here they shall freely and they should they they share freely and give generously to those in need their good deeds will be what remembered what i'm telling you is people remember it forever they will have influence and honor Guys, that's what God does when we are, are, are generous, when we move in that generosity. God does these supernatural things, doesn't he? Well, 
when you came in on your, your seat, there was these little cards I want you to look at with me in just a moment. Uh, and I've got them in a PDF for those people watching online, right? Here's the thing. It's about our legacy team. Our legacy ministry, it runs alongside the church's vision, and it tries to uh, strategically partner up with it to help us to achieve what God is calling us to do, right? And so it looks like this. And what it is, it's an information card, right? And if you want to know more about the legacy ministry, you can fill it out. And there's the five lanes that they are involved in, the projects. There's capital projects, there's college and internship projects, there's missions, and they look at it nationally, globally, and also locally, okay? And so you can check off and, uh, and put that in the clear box when you're leaving. And Pastor Debbie, she oversees all that. And so she's going to make sure she talks with you and invites you to information gathering, okay, on this particular ministry. Now, we've also declared that this weekend, this is the first of the rest of the, the existence of Vineyard that's going to happen, right? We're starting something brand new, spanking new today. This is called our Legacy Weekend. And so you were sent a message uh, via email or a letter by Pastor Andy. And he told you of our initiative to, uh, to once a year to set aside where we would take a legacy offering. And every bit of that legacy offering goes to the legacy team and is used outside of this church, right? It's our, it's our portfolio for growing even more generous than we are, right? And so today, I hope you participate in that. I've already seen people uh, send in different uh, contributions and things like that. You can go on no matter what form you're giving in. And just let me know, though, it's for the legacy offering because we still have our tithes and offerings that take care of the house, right, that take care of what we're doing here ministry-wise. But this is a special one that we do specifically to bless the communities that God has asked us to get involved in, all right? And so we'll be doing that at the end of the service, and I, I want to encourage you to participate in that, right? So that's our, our legacy weekend that we are celebrating that. And like I said, we're starting today. But next year, be the same thing. And then the same. We figure that we want to be the most generous church that we know. <laughs> right? Because why? Because we want a legacy. It's not my legacy. It's our legacy. And this is what Father says, that people that are generous and give, that that's part of the legacy that outlasts us all. All right. This last one, it takes a sense of urgency. So this last value that I'm going to talk to you about today, it takes a sense of urgency. Right? You know, as a person who lays down legacy in her own life, I know that I've been born in a time and an age which is very special to the Lord. And I must make the most of every opportunity, and so must you. You know, we must, we must be urgent in with which we do things, and not just, well, I'll get to it tomorrow. You don't know if you have another tomorrow. Leaving a legacy is important, and we need to move on it today, right? That's what urgency does. It makes us do something today. And that's where I want to challenge you because I think we tend to exaggerate our things in the past and we minimize and underestimate what God wants to do with us today. Yet today is the day that we have to work with, right? Today there's this sense of urgency that today we must move. Today we must take into account of who we are, make the most of today for the time is evil. And this next scripture I'm going to share with you You've seen it that when I've been teaching the last couple months, you've seen me use it over and over. Why? Because I can sense, I can sense the Holy Spirit's hand on it. And this is what it says. Ephesians 5 says, so then be very careful how you live. Be very careful, be intentional, be thinking about it, right? Don't live like foolish people, but like wise people, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And so there's this sense of urgency that comes down towards us. You know, gang, I didn't start out wanting to be on this platform. I didn't start out wanting to be a pastor. <laughs> Not at all. I fell in love with a man called Andy Mead, right? And he so captured my heart. And so when he wanted to, uh, you know, we prayed and he wanted really, he was the, the person that wanted to start the church. Well, I wanted to help him. So you know what? I ran alongside him to help him. And we had kids and you know, life was happening, but you see, my whole life and all my studies, all my degrees was in education and in business, and that's where my heart was. 
And you know, when this church got healthy enough, I went back to the, the Lord and I was like, hey, can I go now? I've got it started. I've helped. He can do it now on his own, right? And you know, when I asked that question, the Lord responded back to me by giving me a vision. A vision like I've never had. This, this vision, I could see myself literally back here on the shores of Virginia Beach where I had been a thousand, thousands of times walking down the beach, right? And the Lord took me right back there. And as I was there, you know, I saw a plane come by, those annoying planes that were down there, dragging a banner that said the name of, of Jesus. And it was so beautiful. And as I gazed upon it, as I was looking at it, I began to come up off the sand and began to move towards it. And then when I was there, I looked back down, and the sand that was there began to grow up into people. And as it grew up into people, there were some that had the banners that said Jesus because they knew who Jesus was. But then on the sand, when I looked again, more numerous than it ever had, and it was more expansive than Virginia Beach. It went all the way up and down the coast was these sands of grain, and they grew, and they grew into people, and they did not have banners that said Jesus. And I knew the reality was that they were facing a Christless eternity, and it so bothered me deep down inside. And I began to cry out to the Lord. I said, Lord, you can't let this happen. This is unjust. And he goes, I said, you know, I'm like, what are you going to do about it? And he said, no, no, what are you going to do about it? And I'm like, me, I can't do anything. I'm nothing special. I'm not, I can't do anything. And then I kept looking at the people. My heart was so compressed that I looked back and I'm like, all right, all right, all right, count me in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign up for this. And you know what? The moment I said that, right, I'm going to tell you what happened in my life. I turned around and I left my procession that I loved. And I've been walking and being a minister ever since then. But it's the greatest calling that I didn't know that was in my heart. Because that's what Jesus had for me, right? And it was in this, this vision that God gave me that I saw this. The minute I said yes, my whole mind exploded with all kinds of concepts. You see, he has developed me as a leader. As one who can see systems and do business organization and all of a sudden I begin to see it in the church and not just our church but churches up and down the east coast developing these systems to help them to reach the lost and I begin to understand right and as I was thinking all these things through now this is the most powerful part for me I heard my name Sharon and I turned around to see that the sun was descending below the water you know that it was disappearing, that sunset was coming, and it was moving ever so slowly down. And then the voice said to me, what you do, do it in a hurry. Uh, you know, I woke up out of that vision, and I really thought to myself, I thought, am I going to die? <laughs> right? I'm carnal-minded. Am I going to die? Do I need to move really quick because, like, something bad's going to happen? Right? I didn't know, but you know, with that urgency, I decided that every day was going to count. I decided every day I'm going to do something to make sure that I am reaching the lost, that I am reaching people, right? And so there's this urgency at which we are called to move. There's no guarantee for tomorrow. As I said earlier, you must feel that urgency. God wants us to move in the, in the cities. He wants us to move in the country. He wants us to move around the world to make a difference in this time and in this space. And that's what he's given you. He's given you that. And he says, when you do these things, you lay a legacy. Now, here's an anchor I want you to take away today. I want you to take this one away with you. Today, I will live if, as if this is the day that will be remembered. That will be remembered. So this is a day that's going to be remembered. What you do today is remembered. Don't, don't put off what you can do today until tomorrow or the next week. Do it today and do it with all urgency. Bow your heads with me. I'm going to close us in prayer. Yes. Thank you, Father. I see you. Yes. Holy Spirit, come. Come even now, Lord God. Those who had ears to hear what the Spirit of God was saying, pay attention.
pay attention. Father so desires, he desires to build a place that he can come and rest in. And he desires to use your heart and your mind. Father, I thank you that you're teaching us about faith. And so, Father, so many of those that hear this, they stop dreaming. They stop, Lord. And so, Holy Spirit, would you activate right now? Would you begin to activate the dreamers? Would you begin to partner up them with the Holy Spirit inside and begin to help them to dream again so that they would have the anchor for their faith, Lord? And Father, help us to choose to be sacrificial. Help us to choose, Holy Spirit, to be sacrificial. Remind us, Father God, remind us of the great gift of salvation that we have received in Jesus Christ. And let that be the empathy, Father. Let that be the driver inside for us to sacrifice for people we don't even know. Yeah. Yes. So there are folks that are in this audience today, and I'm talking about Jesus like he's my best friend, because he is. He is, and I'm nothing special. He's your best friend. He wants to get close to you. And if you feel very far from him today, I want to give you this opportunity to come close, because in my eyes, what I can see is that Father God has prepared a big, long table with lots of chairs, and there's all these people that are sitting there, but there's an empty chair, and there's a place mark there, and it has your name on it. And so Father's calling you home. He's calling, it doesn't matter what you've done in your life. He says, just come on home, and we'll take care of it. And so I'm going to ask you to do something courageous if that's you and you feel like that. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to shoot your hand up so I can see it. And not because I'm going to ask you to come down or anything. It's just a statement of faith that you do. And those online, you're not exempt from this because many of you, that, that empty seat is you also. And so online I've provided a little button that says I've raised my hand, right? And you're going to hit that. You're going to hit that, and that's going to uh, be a, a place of faith for you. It'll be a place of faith for you also in saying this prayer. All right, now those of you in the audience, what I'm going to ask you to do while every head is bowed, while they're in, people are in prayer, what I'm going to ask you to do is to shoot up your hand to signify, yes, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. I want to come home. That empty chair, it's for me, and I realize that. And so I'm going to give you a moment just to shoot it up real, real tall. And it's dark up here, so, mm-hmm, okay. Yep. I see. All right, put your hands down. All right. Now I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, right? You're just going to say to yourself right where you're at, you just, oh, I see. And all of us who are blind, we've all been at this place, and so you know. So you'll be praying for those people that are getting ready to pray this prayer right now. You'll be praying. You know what, how this changes your whole game plan, man changes your whole life so those of you that want this decision for christ today you just say father god go ahead go father god i want to come home that seat is for me i have been lonely and afraid for so long but no more i'm coming home I accept the gift of salvation that is given me through Jesus Christ. Jesus, forgive my sins. Forgive the places I've messed up. I accept the gift right now. And the best way I understand, the best way I know how, I ask you to be the leader of my life. Father God, For those that were praying that, I know your word says that you have sealed it in their heart and that you wrote their name in the book of life and that can never be taken away. And so I ask now that you would begin to get them uh, to a place, Father, where they can grow and they can see the full potential that you've placed inside of them. Yes, that they are children of the God most high. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you for your word, for it is a lamp unto our feet 
It shows us the direction we need to go in, Lord. You want us to stand before you. You want us to be able to hear you say to us, well done, good and faithful child. You want that. And so thank you for your word that teaches us these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, wonderful. Well, those of you that made that decision here in this audience or online, I want to encourage you to tell somebody about it. After uh, we finish today, we've got a full uh, baptism and all, but there's a prayer team up here, and you can come talk to them. Or your perforated tab on your program that was given to you, you can fill that out. Put it in that clear box, right, and it'll come to us. We want to help you with understanding your next steps. Uh, for those of you that uh, have not taken growth track, that is your next step. If you gave your life to Christ, you'll want to do that, and that's immediately following this service, okay, growth track one. And so you can go to that online. We want you to instant message us so that we can send you some information or talk with you because you need to be plugged into a Bible-believing church, okay? Very good. All right, now what's coming up on the screens is we are going to have a time of tithes and offering. So uh, while that's coming up, if you do it electronically, you can go ahead and do that now. Uh, for those of you that want to give to the, the legacy offering, right, you'll want to, you can still give in all the different formats you've been given, only I'm going to ask you to put in there uh, for the legacy offering, right? That way we can separate it out. Remember, all that money is going outside of this church, right? And so we'll want to uh, give you those opportunities. All right, very good, very good. Well, I said we have a huge full uh, agenda for you today, uh, you know, and so we're, you guys are going to get it to watch the baptisms of, of a lot of folks. So this is going to be fun. So I'm going to end my time with you. But before I leave, it's my practice the first of every month to pray over those of you that have generously given. <laughs> so I'm going to do that. And I'm going to ask you to stay seated so that everybody can watch the baptism as in, and they'll be on the screens. Okay? So let me just speak blessings over you. Father God. I thank you for each and every person, Father, that had ears to hear what your spirit was saying. But, Father God, I take this time to recognize that they might be given through Vineyard Community Church, but they are really given to you. We're just stewarding it. They're giving it to you, God, and they're placing it in your hands. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would bless their families, that you would bless their finances, Lord. Shake them, press them out cause them to be fruitful in everything that they're doing in their finances, but also extend that relationally to their families, Lord God, and to, yeah, and to their communities. Give them favor, Father, in all that they do because they are a generous people and they are learning to leave a legacy because you teach us that. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's worship. I search